Hi, welcome to Conversations with Curtis. My name is Paul Morgan Stetler, though you may recognize me as an older, wiser, George Clooney-esque version of Curtis Craig from Phantasmagoria 2, A Puzzle of Flesh. Today we are continuing our Tech Talk with Daniel series, where Daniel Albu, my partner, tracks down some developers and game designers and technicians who created some of your favorite adventure games. And today is no exception. Earlier this week, Daniel sat down with Academy Award-nominated director Graham Annable. Graham has worked at LucasArts and Telltale Games, among others, and has created works for television, film, comic books, and, of course, video games. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with our very first ever Academy Award-nominated guest, Graham Annable. From illustrator to animator, to storyboard artist, to cartoonist, to Academy Award-nominated director, today's guest has done it all. Graham Annable, welcome to Conversations with Curtis. <laughs> Thank you. That's quite the intro. <laughs> yeah. Did I miss anything? or? Uh, if you did, I can't remember. So honestly, I don't know. <laughs> now, before we get into all of the cool projects that you've worked on, let's start at the beginning. How did you get into art? Uh, well, I'm sure this is a familiar story. I mean, I've always been into art, I guess. It's just naturally where I went as a kid. Uh, I drew and doodled on everything and anything I could get my hands on. So I've just been drawing from a very, very early age. Uh, was a big fan of Charles Schultz Peanuts Snoopy mm -hmm. comics. I just I I think early on that's what I thought I would love to do. Um, but I grew up in northern Ontario in Canada and uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. It's a town that's kind of known for steel workers and hockey players. Not a lot of art or cartooning <laughs> that I was aware of. So I never really growing up I never really knew how to get into that profession or even if it was something you could actually make a living doing uh and i will always remember that when i was about to graduate from high school um i was pretty serious about going into the sciences i thought i would do something in science i was really i really enjoyed biology and wasn't so great at chemistry but biology books and all the rest of it and uh, but when i looked at all my textbooks in my science textbooks, they were all covered in doodles. I'd drawn through all of them while I was, you know, listening to lectures and things. And I thought, well, maybe art, maybe art's the more natural place for me to go. Um, but I didn't still know how do you art? How does one art professionally? And a uh, huge fan of film and a huge fan of comics. And in my mind, uh, film and comics put together is animation. And so I applied to uh, Sheridan College in just outside of Toronto, Ontario, and, uh, and and got into the classical animation program there. And so I feel like that was sort of the beginnings of me actually understanding what it took to be a an artist <laughs> working in the arts. And, and during your start, did you start working as an artist or did it come afterwards? Uh, well, I spent three years at Sheridan and graduated from the program there and then was an assistant manager at a video store in downtown Toronto for <laughs> close to a year. Um, but I was, you know, right in Toronto, there's a lot of animation studios there, and I was lucky enough to finally land a job animating uh, at a studio called Phoenix Animation Studios, which is not there any longer, and working on a British kids show called Mumphy the Elephant. Um, and that's where I started animating. And I realized for as much as I had learned in school, I didn't really start learning how to animate until I was in a job situation and you really had to figure things out and deliver finished shots and things. Um, it, was, it was a big learning curve, um, but it was great. I loved it. And uh, from that job, I got an opportunity to in between on a goofy movie. And that was like, that was like the first time I worked in feature film. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the beginnings of it. And what was your role in the Goofy movie? Uh, it was in, in Betweener, which is kind of a 
I don't know that that position exists anymore. You know, this was still done. This was early '90s, and this was still done the old school way, where uh, that particular Disney production was kind of spread out amongst a lot of different uh, international studios. Um, I think most of most of the animation we received, uh, the key animation was done in France. And so we would get stacks of scenes from French animators and, you know, they were all keyed out. I don't know. I don't know how much into the details of animation process I Get should go or all not of the go. the details you want. <laughs> anyway. This is a technical conversation. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, so, yeah, we would get the keyframes from um, France, and our studio was tasked with cleanup and in betweening, which then we would do the in between drawings, you know, and the animators have their little timing charts on the drawings. You had to figure out how many drawings of Goofy or Goofy's son needed to be in between to make the movement work the way it was intended. Uh, and then we would also do cleanup on that, on the, on the work, which was, you know, cleaning up the rough pencils. You take a separate sheet and you do the nice, nice drawings uh, over top so that the cell painters could then paint it later. Um, so yeah, it was pretty old school now that I talk about it out loud. It's pretty analog. Yes. Very much analog at that time. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do after that? Uh, I continued working on different television productions in Toronto for the next little while. Um, I'm trying to think of my whole time. I, if, let's see, the timeline there was... So while I was still in Toronto, uh, I got an amazing opportunity that uh, Chuck Jones, uh, don't know if you're familiar with that name, but you know mm -hmm. Warner Brothers cartoons from back in the back in the day... Yep. He had his own production company, and they were trying very hard to get theater shorts, traditional theater shorts happening again in movie theaters. You know, those sort of seven minutes. It's what the original Warner Brothers cartoons were, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those little cartoons that would play before the movie. His company was trying to get that going again. Uh, my portfolio got selected, and I got to storyboard uh, a whole seven-minute short with Daffy and Porky Pig getting abducted by aliens. I got to make up the whole thing the way I wanted to do it for the most part. Uh, and then I got to fly down to LA for like a week and work with another with a, a whole group of other story artists who'd been selected. We got to work directly with Chuck Jones and uh, and sort of polish each of the each of the shorts up. And it was amazing. It was like one of the it still is one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in animation. Um and I walked away starstruck? from. Starstruck. I was a little bit, and honest, I will be honest. Like I've not been, I've not been a very good fanboy in terms of animation. I, 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 I love the medium for what it can do and, the, and things, but I'm always thinking about what I can do with it. And I've, uh, it's taken me a long time to recognize and understand just how important some some of these people like Chuck Jones were to. So at the actual time of working with Chuck Jones, I didn't quite understand how amazing and unique that opportunity had been until it was after the fact. Uh, but, you know, just sort of young young and stupid and whatever. Um, but uh, I walked away from that experience thinking, well, that's that's the, that's what I want to do in animation. I want to be a storyboard artist. I'd, I'd, that just appealed to me on so many levels because it was, well, I don't know, my attention span, I guess, is short and I need to keep moving on to different ideas. And so storyboarding was the greatest thing ever because you could just quickly do one idea and move on to the next one. Um, so yeah, I walked away from that experience for sure thinking that I'd be a story artist. Uh, and then I spent the next 11, no, 12 years working at LucasArts as, a, as an animator. <laughs> so it didn't quite did go- did you start working at LucasArts? Uh, shortly after that, after that stint on Chuck Jones, and this would have been 1994. Um, so yeah, I was in between things in Toronto, and I think I was in the midst of trying to put together a story artist portfolio. But then this opportunity came up where a friend of a friend called up and said that uh, LucasArts in California was looking for more, was willing to hire Canadian animators because they were having a hard time, I guess, coercing a lot of the animators from the LA area up to the Bay Area. San Francisco was just far enough away that a lot of, I guess, LA-based people were just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not relocating. 
but Canadians were, were happy to come down. So <laughs> nice weather, why not? Um, so yeah, I ended up at LucasArts. And that, again, uh, with, you know, with George Lucas's games company, uh, I walked into that place not, you know, I consider myself a gamer to some extent uh, in that I certainly play, I, I lived at the arcade as a kid, uh, you know, but that's like the really old school stuff of Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man and Asteroids and all the classic blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. for whatever reason, my sort of time gaming, I kind of skipped over, I didn't have a personal computer. I skipped over that whole thing of the adventure games and this whole legacy that LucasArts had built. I, I was pretty oblivious to and so I was finding myself working animating at LucasArts not really understanding like, like how big a deal that was in terms of like I started working on Full Throttle and I didn't really know who Tim Schafer was or any of those people at that time um, they were just nice people and it was a fun job to do um, and it was a really it seems, it seems like a pattern you're not starstruck in <laughs> real time you're starstruck yeah but the reason after. the reason I'm not starstruck is because I'm dumb I just didn't I didn't understand enough of the context of what I was stepping into. I just had the skills I had to do the things I did and I, you know, I don't yeah, again, it, uh, so much of it looking back I'm I've just like I'm astounded at uh, how lucky I've been <laughs> throughout a lot of my career for the experiences I've I've had. Um but it was great, but I do remember thinking like it was so weird uh cuz I had just finished on that goofy movie for Walt Disney and the skill required to do the cleanup and in betweening on that film was really intense. Like that was that pushed me to the limits of what I was as an artist at that time. Like it was really hard to do. I mean, those Disney characters are complex, sophisticated designs, and there's there's no cheating on those things. Everybody knows exactly how Goofy's supposed to look, and you know. So there was a lot of parameters. It was really tough stuff to do, and it was funny to go from that to suddenly I was at LucasArts and I was trying to, I was animating Ben Throttle doing a walk cycle with, a, with a mouse, like with, with just pixels. And it was like so blocky and you, it was weird to go from such a highly tuned thing with a pen and pencil. And suddenly I'm just using a mouse with squares and pixels to make stuff move. Um, Do you remember any of the scenes you've worked on in Full Throttle? Um, because I came onto the production late, and so they were done a lot of stuff, I did a lot of weird little fix-its and things. Like, uh, I remember having to do a scene where uh, the, the, the nut comes out of the wheel on Ben's bike, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to animate. That's in the intro. Is it in the, I don't even remember the specific, like, locations of a lot of the scenes, but yeah, I had to do that. Oh my God, I had to do a bit where uh, a whole bunch of sand got dumped onto the roadway. Mm -hmm. I remember that because that, again, doing it pixel by pixel was really tough when you had to do things that were fluid. And I guess in a, in a sense, I ended up initially doing a lot of what you would classify as visual effects stuff with pixels, um, props and moving, you know, because again, I was sort of an unknown quantity at the beginning there. So they just kind of gave me some of the lighter fix it shots to do um and again they were late and they were pretty close to finishing that game when i showed up so it's interesting the the scene with the uh, with another falling from the the wheel it's not exactly in the intro it's in the first couple of minutes of the game but these things weren't ready by that time in production well you, you know when you play a game you just presume that chrono it was all built chronologically like you know how the story but it, it's it never goes that way. I mean, there's there's just shots in production that uh, both in film and video games, you could be working on the ending of a movie at the beginning of it half the time, you know, and and or, you know, the first run through of that shot after everybody's played it through a number of times, they're like, you know what, that shot's not working. We got to come up with a different solution or whatever. So things always evolve and shift. And so a lot of stuff that you, you know, the very first thing you're going to see on the screen might have been the, one of the last things done on the movie because they finally nailed, you know, dialed it into what exactly was the best opening thing to do. Or maybe um, it was done a week before release. Yeah, a lot of times that happens too. <laughs> now, you've also worked on The Dig, and The mm -hmm. Dig was notorious for being the LucasArts adventure game with the longest development time. 
Yes. Did you review any of the previous versions of the dig? Or did not, you just not do your so own much. thing? Not so much. Uh, when I showed up again, I think because I was sort of one of the new people, uh, a lot of the new people <laughs> got shuffled onto the dig. Uh, so I spent a short stint on full throttle and then they were, they were crewing up for another run at, at, at trying to get the dig to happen. Uh, and I knew going in that, yeah, it'd been a project that had had a lot of, uh, issues and re rewrites and all kinds of stuff. Um, I remember seeing some earlier, but I can't remember specifically any of it at this point, but we sort of came on as this freshly new assembled team to take another run at it. And Sean Clark, I think, had just finished writing a whole new version of it. And so, for better or for worse, our our stint on it was the one that became the game and, and finally got or it better. done. <laughs> okay, good. Um, that was a strange game to work on. Uh, again, because it was partly... That was truly, I guess, my intro to to working as an animator in games. Because as much as I worked on full throttle, I only did little bits here and there. But the dig, I was, you know, one of the one of the main animators on it. Um, and I've told this story many times. But one of the one of my favorite moments in terms of my career as an animator has always been that I got assigned to do the little space turtle character that. Uh, is it Brink? I don't know. Everybody walked into that, that little area with the la, sort of lagoon. Mm -hmm. And they needed that space turtle because later the bones the work into the... puzzle. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know it at the time that that would become like one of the <laughs> nastiest puzzles in it. But uh, but my task was like, just bring this little space turtle guy to life. Like do whatever you want to do with him. But they, they gave me free reign on it. And I spent months just doing little idle animations for him and having him have little swims into the water. And like, you know, as long as I made sure everything could hook back up and, and loop and get through all of it. And it was like the most uh, meditative thing I've ever animated in my life. Like I just spent, I looked forward to every day going into work and just noodling with that space turtle and doing whatever and just trying to figure out things a space turtle could do. Um, yeah, that's Maybe always... explode. Yeah, well, eventually, yes. But uh, yeah, that was what, like, one of the funnest things I, to this day I've ever animated just because it was so relaxing. I don't understand why people consider it as the the most difficult puzzle in the game because I think pretty later in production, they added a fossil somewhere in the lagoon over there mm -hmm. that is supposed to show you the structure of the skeleton of that turtle. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be the solution to that puzzle, but nobody found the, the fossil. <laughs> It's their fault. Yeah, it's a user error. Yep. <laughs> now, do you remember which scenes you worked on, uh, apart from the, the one with the turtle in the dig? And did you get to work with ILM on some of these scenes? Mm, I do not remember ILM being too involved with... I know, oh, it's, that's right, they did some of the open... I think they did some of the ship stuff, right? And my gosh. Mm. I, yeah, I don't... I. Gosh, what do I remember doing? It was fun because, you know, a lot of the, obviously all, all the in-game animation we did was done again with, with a mouse and pushing pixels around. And I mean, it has its own satisfying process to it, but nothing beats, you know, being able to draw with a pencil. So all the cutscene stuff we got to, you know, do traditionally, and then they would scan it in. Um trying to remember i remember doing i think it's the opening bit right where they're at the sort of conference mm -hmm. and having to do like the, the somebody raising their hand and getting up in the foreground to ask a question and animating the, you know the the main characters all sort of sitting at their little you uh, close up of each one of the characters yeah i can't say for sure i did any of the close-ups i i remember doing that wide shot because I remember uh, it being fussy with making sure the silhouette of that guy raising his hand and everything read correctly. And it was one of those things where it took longer to get to a good result than I wanted it to, but it, uh, we got there. Um, yeah, I remember doing... You did doing... an amazing job on the oh. silhouette. It was <laughs> Thank pretty you. believable. Thank you. Good, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, after 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 the dig, you worked on Curse of Monkey Island. Yes, 
Uh, were you a fan of the series or well, was again, this your first introduction? To it? First real introduction to it. I mean, obviously having then spent a year or two at LucasArts already, uh, uh, I was aware of Monkey Island and how much that meant to so many people. So I knew that when we were working on it, that this was a, it definitely felt like a big deal. Like, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of buzz about, you know, fans wanting this game and all the rest of it. So we knew it was a bigger deal than it had been. But it was interesting because that third game, uh, you know, it was Larry Ahern and Jonathan Ackley and, and um, so different people, you know, heading up the project and, and a whole different look. Like it was just not related at all to to what the previous ones had been. Uh, and it was exciting for us as an animation team because, yeah, we suddenly, uh, we weren't pushing pixels anymore. We were, we, that whole game, we were hand drawing, like doing it traditionally on an animation desk and scanning those drawings in. And I think partly because that process was new to the studio for the most part. And they'd had a little, you know, a little bit of success for sure with how the dig cutscenes had turned out that they felt confident that, yeah, we could do this whole game like how we did the cutscenes for the dig. And it all worked out. But um, I think from a production standpoint, I don't think they quite understood did the sort of how to economize and, and and sort of budget the effort I guess put forth and it was great for us as artists because we got to work at frame rates and and draw like we were drawing a full-on like fully animated feature like there was no it wasn't like TV animation for the most part we weren't being told to just keep things on fours or twos or we could, we could get as intricate and slick as long as we could hit the deadlines that they laid out and so man we just really uh as an animation team really enjoyed working on that because it felt like everybody was getting a crack at doing the best animation they could possibly do you know and some of the other folks on that team had come from uh tv backgrounds and stuff and they were just sort of amazed that we were allowed to just go for it on a lot of things and make things as fluid and as nice as we could possibly do it um, you know, of course, it was still mid '90s, so some of the frame rates and things were still kind of chunky when they played back in the computer. But the drawings were all there, and it would have, if the frame rates could handle it, it would, it you know, it could be as slick as anything that was in a yeah, theater. There's one scene with the snake when the snake eats Guybrush hmm. that many people, um, the game crashed for many people because hmm. it re- required a lot of memory. Yeah. So a lot of people had to upgrade their computers to watch that entire animation from <laughs> beginning to end. Yeah, I believe it. Again, they just they did not hold us back as a team for for the amount of frames and things we'd throw in there. So um now, now the Curse of Monkey Island marked the end of an era at LucasArts with it being the last to the adventure game, the last scum engine game mm-hmm. basically. Um, how did the shift to 3D affect your day-to-day work at LucasArts? Uh, it was scary. Um, I remember at the time, like, knowing that everything was starting to shift to console games and uh, and that everything was shifting to 3D programs, and I was not so sure I was on board for that. Like, I did start considering, like, oh, maybe I should... <laughs> well, honestly, my original plan when I was still in Toronto was that I was going to be moving or try my luck out in Vancouver, Canada, because there's a lot of TV animation studios out there. And the reason I, uh, part of the reason I got the job at LucasArts was I had a portfolio all ready to go because that portfolio had been intended for me to take to Vancouver, BC and try to see if I could get work there. Um, and so it was at that time when that shift was happening where I started to think, well, maybe this is when I now like I had originally planned head back to Canada and go up into Vancouver and start and, and go back to TV or film. Um, but LucasArts was great uh, in that they, as a studio, were like, hey, we want to help all you 2D artists make this trans- transition. And uh, they gave us tons of training on all the... And at that time, it was such a weird time because there were so many different soft uh, 3D software animation programs all vying to be the one. Mm-hmm. And all the projects at LucasArts, I think each of them had a different plat- a different software they were using. Because um, I remember Lightwave, learning that. I remember learning th- uh, 
Auto, was it 3D Auto Desk or what was the name of it? I'm forgetting all the names. Uh, there was at least three different ones. Um, and we got training on all of them. Like we got to do whatever, which ones we gravitated to and or, you know, which project we were assigned to. So I think I initially started working with Lightwave first. Um, and I found that I actually enjoyed it. It was, uh, you know, finishing, making something come alive in, in 3D and CG animation was just as satisfying as, as drawing it I, at the end of the day. Because it was, uh, I don't know, in my mind, it felt almost like it's kind of like puppeteering. You know, you're just kind of moving that model around. And uh, yeah, it was way more fun than I thought it was going to be. And so I stuck around because it was... It was a great job, and you know, again, the studio had been so accommodating to to actually train all of us up on it, um, and I really enjoyed doing the work. Um, but because of that shift, uh, I did find that I I personally missed hand drawing on a daily basis, and so because of that shift at LucasArts is what kind of sparked, motivated me to kind of dive back into comics um, because I think like as I was saying earlier like I'd always pictured myself or hoped that I would do a comic either a newspaper strip or I'd be working at comic books uh, I don't know I always wanted to be part of that world in some way and so because of that shift to the 3d software I I started doing my own short stories comic comic book short stories on my own time and started self-publishing those things. And uh, that's kind of what led me down that path uh, where I eventually picked up a publisher and then I was doing sort of indie comics on the side as well. Um, so I have, I guess, 3D to thank for that. <laughs> you did 3D by day and 2D by night? Yep, pretty much at, for, for a good chunk of the latter years at LucasArts. Now the switch to 3D didn't stop LucasArts from working on adventure games altogether with uh, Green Fandango and Escape from Monkey Island being released in 1998 and 2000, respectively. Mm -hmm. It seemed like they haven't given up on the genre. And in the early 2000s, three adventure games went into production. Uh, Full Throttle Payback, Full Throttle Hell on Wheels, and, Full Th and, and Sam and Max Freelance Police. Did you get to work on any of them? Uh, you know, my biggest regret uh, of my time at LucasArts was the fact that I didn't work on Grim Fandango. Um, again, looking back, I feel like, oh, if I'd probably recognized how cool that project was early on and made a bit of a push to get onto that team, I might have been able to have gotten on there. But uh, but I didn't. I was. I mean, I was happy. I worked on Outlaws. Uh, I helped Mike Stemley do a bunch of stuff on Afterlife, um, and I was sort of I was I was sort of having fun avoiding Star Wars projects, but and doing like these little creative endeavors. And it's not that I didn't like Star Wars, but uh, I wasn't like super fanboy for Star Wars by the time I got to LucasArts. I mean, I loved those films, obviously, like any of us, and and, and my generation, like you grew up with it, and I was obsessed with it for a time but uh i think maybe being so close to ilm and lucasarts and the whole thing and, and it's just you're so steeped in it around there that i was like ah this is like the last thing i want to work on for the most part and so i i did a pretty good job of avoiding star wars on all these other little projects other games but i didn't get onto grim fandango because i just didn't recognize how cool it was until it was kind of too late they'd really staffed up and that project, every time I'd walk down the hallways and look at the concept art that Peter Chan had all up on the walls and stuff, it was just like, oh my God, this looks amazing. You just knew it was going to be something really special. Um, so I didn't get onto either iteration uh, or any of the full throttle versions, but I did get selected to be the lead animator on uh, Sam and Max Freelance Police. Mm -hmm. And... That project, out of all the stuff I worked at LucasArts, that project was the best project I ever worked on there um, in terms of just the chemistry of the team, people, and the whole world of Sam and Max was just so much fun to work with. Uh, yeah, it was, that was a dream project. That was fantastic. 
But because of the timing of when it was happening, there was this thing hanging over it the whole time of like the company always, you you just knew it was in the air. Like, should we be spending the money making adventure games? There's no future in this. And just all that stuff just kept hovering around it. But we just kind of kept our heads down and tried to make the best game we possibly could. Um, and we almost got there. We almost got there. It was so close. I think we had about, I like to say about 85% of that thing finished before the ax got swung. Now, all three projects were eventually canceled with the uh, Full Throttle Payback being canceled around 2000, 2001. Yep. And Full Throttle Hell on Wheels in August 2003. And Seven Max in March of 2004. Now, how did the team take the news? Did, did you guys figure it's about to happen? Did the cancellation of, of the Full Throttle sequels um, made you understand that maybe it's going to happen to your project as well? Or did it actually come as a surprise? A little of both. I mean, like I said, we all knew either on the Full Throttle team or on Sam and Max that there was a definite feeling like maybe the studio shouldn't be doing this. And so everybody was just trying to get as good a game together as they could, but it was always a weird pressure feeling of the company itself wasn't necessarily totally behind it. You kind of had to keep proving that there was a reason to make this project. Um, and I don't know the dates and things, but you know, a lot of it in my mind, from my perspective, hap- the, the reason those projects did finally get axed was the all the upper management kind of changed over. Like I think when Simon Jeffries left and it was Jim Ward that took over. I mean, you could feel it. The whole tone and flavor of the company completely shifted. It was like, <laughs> why would, you know, it was, it was a, I, I can't fault them for it. I mean, if you're looking at it in terms of just pure numbers and, and not artistically and pragmatically, you're just like, why are we wasting resources and time on these things where everyone's already convinced outside of these walls in the gaming world that these genres are dead it's star wars guys we're making star wars games that's what we should have been doing the whole time and let's just full-on star wars you know and it was so as soon as that sort of leadership took over we knew we were really on uh, running out of time um and again i don't remember the timing of like when the full throttle you, you just mentioned the dates so the full throttle games yeah they got axed before ours Yeah. Our game had just enough internal momentum and we, again, it was just, the team was working so well. And I think every time we had to do a little, what they call dog and pony show for management, it always impressed everyone. So it was always like, ah, this is kind of amazing. So maybe we'll keep, you know, maybe this will find its place. And we got, we were getting so close to the finish line of it. But again, when that sort of leadership had changed, it was just like, nope, don't care. It's over. Uh, and so I think... As a team, we knew it could happen. We felt like it was always likely to happen, but at the same time, there was a na- naive optimism in how good a thing we were building that we hoped that we maybe we could just get to the finish line in time before somebody <laughs> higher up would you know put a put a knife in it um so In some ways, it felt like it came without warning because we really were getting so close to the end that we thought, we're going to do it. We're going to be able to finish this game. And then all of a sudden, there was a meeting just called by upper management, and they just brought the whole team in and basically told us that we were no longer going to be working on Sam and Max Freelance Police and that it was being put on a shelf, and that was it. And uh, you know, it happens to anybody and everybody that works in the entertainment industry, but man, it just... It is a weird feeling when you've, you know, at that point we must have been working for at least a year or two years, maybe three years. On, I don't know. We put a lot of time and effort. And to have it just erased within like a five-minute meeting was just, it was just the weirdest feeling to walk out of that room. Like it only took a five-minute meeting and that was it. We're not making this. It's not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, that was a bummer. That was a real one of, definitely one of the not-so-great moments in my career. Now, a couple of years ago, you shared on Twitter a few storyboards from your work on the Freelance Police mm-hmm. uh, project, which included Hoagie and Bernard from Day of the Tentacle. That's right. Yeah. There was a little bit of overlap. Uh, gosh, you know, I I am the worst. Because again, as I've explained to you, I still don't, you know, 
I wasn't steeped in the legacy of so many of those things. Uh, Mike Stemley, brain, I mean, he was just all about crossovers and Easter eggs and finding things that would be cool little winks to the fans. Like he was, he was like the biggest fanboy there was for LucasArts in a way. And yet he was there project leading and he just knew how to layer in like very densely a lot of things. So Mike had so many little plans of stuff like that in there. But I can't say that I specifically can remember. I just remember uh, at the time being really excited that I was allowed to do storyboards because, again, I knew deep in my heart that that's what I really wanted to do. And so when I got the opportunity on Sam and Max to do boards, it was super fun. Um, and yeah, I came across a box of them when, uh, when I made a move a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, I still have these. Do you have more? Uh, I might. I'd have to dig again. I have uh, reassembled my studio space here. And of course, as soon as I do that, then stuff out of sight, out of mind. But I might uh, I might have to dig through there. And uh, yeah, because I was, I was, I'm always surprised uh, and impressed with the fan base for, for the, for the LucasArts adventure stuff. Like it means a lot to certain folks. Like it's incredible. Uh, Cause you know, I've, I've been lucky again, lucky enough to work on a lot of pretty cool projects in film and TV and games and everything. And uh, every time I will mention a LucasArts game, when I'm talking about my career or whatever, there's always at least one or two people that like lose their minds. Cause it's like, Oh my God, that, more than anything, any of the other stuff, that just means the most. <laughs> and yeah. those games are really special. Now, when did you leave LucasArts? And what was the last project you worked on there? Hmm. I would have left LucasArts in 2005. So about a year after Sam and Max, it got canceled because I got, I finally got moved on to a Star Wars project. Uh, and it was on episode three. Mm -hmm. and it was kind of a nightmare to walk into it just it was a it was a tricky situation because um up to that point i'd you know been a lead animator but i'd basically been a lead animator on cartoonish games and things that you know were a little more uh lighthearted uh whatever i didn't need to be super serious and steeped in the whole star wars universe and suddenly i, I found myself asked to be lead animator in episode three and i was like well i'll give it my best shot um and a lot of my job for that was just trying to untangle and get uh it was because it was a it was a partnership between lucas arts and another studio down in la whose name i'm forgetting right now and that studio, I think, had, you know, the reason they, we were partnering up with them was because that studio had already had a lot of success doing fighter-type games, and they were really good at figuring out all the all the particulars of, you know, really good fight mechanics and all that stuff. Um, and so, but the project at that time was a bit of a disarray because both studios didn't seem to have a clear picture of what what they were, what they had ownership over. And so I just remember it was like, oh my gosh, it was a lot of delicate political things of trying to sort of separate the two studios so that everybody could focus on what they were good at and not get in each other's way doing things. And uh, I think it ultimately turned out okay, um, but it was a very stressful, stressful job to suddenly walk into from what had been previously my dream job with the Sam and Max is suddenly this like high-powered, high-intensity game and whew, it was wild. Um, so that was the last thing I worked on there. And then I left to be the art director, creative director at Telltale when they were beginning. Which games did you work on at Telltale? Uh, I helped out on anything and everything there at the beginning. So, you know, it was the uh, Texas Hold'em poker game that we first kicked out the door. Um, and, uh, well, the Bone, the bo first Bone game out of Boneville and a little bit of Cow Race. Uh, I helped a little bit on some of the CSI stuff they were doing. I kind of just sort of, you know, again, I was trying to help art direct and and, and just kind of, I was just wearing a lot of hats and doing wherever, wherever there was a fire burning, I would try to help and put it out. Um, so it was a lot of 
different different things. Um, it was fun to get the bone. I feel like the out of Boneville was probably the game that I worked on the most there, um, and it was it was a cool thing because it was um, that situation kind of partially happened because because of my connections to the world of comics mm -hmm. and um, Jeff Smith, the creator of Bone, was was a fan of my stuff, and so I had met him uh, at, new, at numerous comic conventions and sort of you know. I was uh, an acquaintance. I wouldn't say we were friends, but we certainly knew of each other. And so uh, one of the other folks, John Scro, working at Telltale, our technical director, he was like the biggest Bone fan I've ever, ever met in my life. And when he found out that I knew Jeff Smith, he was like, oh my God, we should make that game. And that just, between John's enthusiasm and my connection, we were able to generate enough conversations and enthusiasm in both Kevin and Dan who were running the company that uh yeah we got paired up with Jeff Smith and got to make you know a few bone games and that was really exciting times at that at that at those early days of Telltale now two, two months before uh, Seven Max was cancelled in January mm -hmm. 2004 Mike Stanley was interviewed about this the, the sequel and he described the plot for the LucasArts sequel for Seven Max as six stories loosely held together by a thrilling uber plot. Now, from the start, Telltale based its business model around episodic games. Was this an original idea that came after founding Telltale, or, or did it originate from the cancelled Sam and Max? Um, it's hard game? to say. Hard to say because uh, the episodic thing, I think, for Mike Stemley was a structure thing and how to sort of break the game up and the flow of it. And I think also mm -hmm. allowed him creatively to have smaller bite-sized pieces. I, I think he was just really interested in the whole sort of pulp stories and like, you know, it, it totally naturally fit Sam and Max to not to have like these short little chapters. Um, so I, and from my perspective, it was more of a creative choice from Mike in terms of why it was structured like that. I think it was also, again, like <laughs> Mike just loves densely packed things. And I think the idea of having these like ch little chapters allowed him to just pack all kinds of stuff into each one of them as opposed to, again, an overall thing. Um, but I know that Kevin Bruner... Ha had always been thinking about downloadable content and stuff. Like he knew he was pretty sure that's where things would go eventually. And I don't know that he would have, if those conversations happened at least, I think that was after, but he definitely had his eye the whole time of the beginnings of telltale of like figuring out a way to create a company that could do smaller scale things that would be downloadable. And that so funny to think back on it now, like, because where we are now, like, yeah, of course, duh. But back then, it was still like really irritating and mind blowing to a lot of people that you would present things like that and not have physical discs. And like, I just remember so much concern about, well, what if your website goes down and what what if I can't access my content and all these things? Like, it's all it's all eph ephemeral and it won't be there and just so much panic about that all the time and now it's like the way we all consume everything <laughs> it's like you know i yeah, still like... i still enjoy physical objects and i love having you know albums and things but it's more of an art piece than it is the worry about having the access to the content i guess i don't know it's just a funny it was just interesting to see that shift and yet early on kevin bruner seemed to recognize that that was the way it would go um and he went wanted... the opposite direction of what tv did because Netflix now releases the entire season, mm -hmm. and the games became episodic. Yeah, yeah, weird and thing. In the nineties, it was the other way around. It's you so true. A, an episode every week, and the entire game at once. So true. Yeah. Uh, again, part of that vision, I guess, that Kevin had for it, and Dan as well. Um, I, but I know specifically Kevin because uh, he. I remember him always saying like how he was so tired of spending like you know four plus five plus years working on a big big game and then you know then just reading like all caps comments from 12 year olds who effing hated the game and like were just dissing it and there's nothing he can do anymore because it's locked on a shelf it's done um 
and you know doing episodes would allow some level of flexibility to to course correct as you're designing and making that game so it's like if chapter two is out and you, you know you might be ahead and already finishing up chapter four but you're starting to get feedback on what's truly working or what's great or bad or good and there's a there was a level of like flexibility then to to redesign or rethink things on the f on the fly a bit and and kind of keep honing your product as opposed to having it sort of locked and frozen solid after five years of hoping that you were doing it right and i think a lot of that appealed to him as a programmer and, and just a creative you know person now given that you've worked on both the lucas arts sam and max sequel and on season one of the Sam and Max series at Telltale. Mm. What were the major differences between both? Well, it's not easy for me to speak to that because when we started to ramp up on the Sam and Max at Telltale, I was pretty much leaving. <laughs> and I didn't want to leave Telltale. It was, such a, it was a great job. It was hectic as anything I've ever done. Um, but as I was saying earlier on in the interview uh you know i really needed to work in film again i really wanted to 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 try take a shot at being a, a storyboard artist in film and i got like the opportunity that i just couldn't couldn't refuse uh i got the opportunity to go up to portland oregon and and work on Coraline with henry selick and be a storyboard artist so <clears throat> uh kevin and dan were great they understood that they knew that that was something i just really really needed to do and so the timing of when i left was right at the beginnings of the sam and max stuff um what i can recall is just that there was a ton of excitement because uh i feel like i don't know how much input uh, ability that Steve Purcell had to work with LucasArts for that freelance police game. I mean, Mike Stemley was certainly doing everything he could to honor that license and those characters in that world, and he was doing a great job with it. But I don't know that LucasArts allowed Steve Purcell to have a whole lot of say or consulting or anything. And I feel like, you know, because of what Telltale was at that time and pretty small, and and Steve certainly knew Kevin and Dan quite well, that I think... I have to presume for for Steve at least it was a better situation because I think he was allowed a bit bit more he could be as involved as he wanted to be in terms of just seeing what they were up to and where the game was at and you know I mm -hmm. feel like Steve's involvement was more present at least in the early beginnings of the season 1 than I remember his presence at all much for the for the freelance police game so that was a definite difference I think now, one of my favorite Telltale games is Puzzle Agent. Ah. How did that project come about? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, while I was working at Telltale Games, you know, I had my side career in indie comics doing st stuff and <clears throat> constantly trying to come up with different ideas and things. I had the, uh, I don't know if you were... <clears throat> visiting that website in its early days but we had the dank comic strip which was the little caveman mm -hmm. character and then that shifted into the dank and dunk thing and uh you know kevin and dan always expressed an interest in some at some point making a graham animal game of some sort and we didn't know what that would be or where the, when that would happen but we'd always talked about it and then of course i left and was up in portland and while I worked on the Coraline production, we hit a weird point in the fa in the in the process where um, <clears throat> Henry Selick was, you know, the the way it works with film traditionally is uh, the storyboard artist. You know, you get you get your script pages, you <clears throat> have a launch meeting with the director, and they kind of describe the things they want to see in the scene and the sequence. And then you go off and do the storyboards and try to turn those words into, you know, visual representation. And you pitch it. As a story artist, you pitch it one-on-one -on -one with the director and you kind of walk them through how you think the sound effects, you know, it's all those famous photos we always see of the Walt Disney story artists where they're doing the funny faces and with the pointer. And it, it really was that 
kind of thing. And so we would pitch boards to Henry and if it went well, he loved them and it was great. And then those boards would get sent down to the edit team. <clears throat> and then the edit team would put it into an animatic. And that process, that, that transition from the pitch that Henry heard to the actual animatic, a lot of times just, and it's, man, it was no diss on the edit team because a lot of times the edit team just wasn't in on those pitch sessions. So they didn't hear how it was delivered. And so there's a lot of nuances and things that get lost and they reinterpret those boards. And basically Henry would see the finished animatic and be like, this just isn't as funny or is it, it isn't the same idea. Like some things had shifted on him. And so he got the idea that it would be a great thing for the story team to do their own little quick edits. Cause we, <clears throat> at that time, uh, it was the Apple. We were all using Apples, and it was the uh, what is the name of the Apple app that comes with, or the movie app that came with it? Um, QuickTime? Not QuickTime. It turned. It made QuickTime. So iMovie. iMovie. It was iMovie, and iMovie and the early versions of it <clears throat> was kind of like perfect for making really fast, easy animatics. And so we got into this process where we would make our own animatics to show Henry. And then if you love them, that would go down to the editor and the editor would just sort of have to mimic that. And I don't know how much the edit team appreciated that because that kind of pulled some of their creative <laughs> ability out of it. Anyway, long story to say that I ended up learning how to make quick little movies, animated shorts in iMovie. And that was right when YouTube was kind of blowing up. <clears throat> and I was like, wait a minute, I could make... I had all kinds of ideas for little animated shorts and I was like, I don't I don't have to go through a festival circuit. I don't have to have anybody approve this. I could just make, you know, it seems so, again, it seems so obvious now, but back then that was still kind of a novel thing. I was like, I could just make animated shorts and put them up on YouTube. And I started doing that. And um, I still remember one day, like one of the shorts I did, you know, I would get maybe a hundred views, maybe 15 likes, whatever, you know, like it was pretty low traffic stuff. <clears throat> and then one day I posted something and the next morning I looked at it and I was like, does that, does that really say 800,000 views? Like what? Like at that time, that seemed like an astronomical number. And yeah, one of my shorts had gotten put on the front page of YouTube for a short time because they used to have editor YouTube uh, editors that would just pick stuff they liked and just throw it on the front page and it got on there. And so then it just kind of took off where I was just always doing animated shorts on the side. And so because I was doing those animated shorts, <clears throat> Kevin and Dan kept, you know, we obviously kept in touch and they were like this kind of weird world that you've made in those animated shorts. Like, is there anything you think could be worked into a game? Cause we would like to do, something original we're, we're you know they were having decent success doing licensed things but there was still a desire for something that i had created and something that could be sort of truly a telltale property or something to happen and so um my wife was playing a lot of professor layton at that time <laughs> and i was like oh man that's like the perfect easiest way to map a narrative onto some pretty fun gameplay. Cause what I liked about it, and again, you know, I just not a huge gamer, but much like the adventure games, I guess, the Professor Layton things were great because there wasn't a lot of stress involved. You could you could chip away at the storyline at your own pace. You could put it down whenever you wanted to. I don't know. That whole thing really appealed to me. And I was like, I could totally see this working. And uh, you know, I was a huge, still am a huge fan of the Coen brothers and, and David Lynch. And I was like, I could, I just, I don't know exactly how that idea really came about. I don't know. I just started working with the idea that it could be, you know what? I was reading um, uh, Dashiell Hammett and uh, those film noir books, but for the detective stuff back in the 30s and 40s, uh, forgetting, uh, I'm forgetting the other writer. Oh my God, the other super famous film noir. Anyway, I was into detective books at the time and that's kind of like, I just, I basically made a short for Puzzle Agent 
that just would give a flavor of what that world could feel like. And I just pitched it as like something that could be mapped onto a Professor Layton-ish template. And I showed them the video and I wasn't sure what they really were going to think of it, but I just was like, this is what I would like to make. And they came out of the meeting and they're like, we're going to make that. That is awesome. And, and so the next thing I knew, they just assembled a team and they were starting to build it. And, uh, it was crazy. I just, I was then spending nights at home, uh, creating animation assets for the game as they built it and just consulting with different writers at Telltale to try to work out, you know, a decent narrative for the whole thing. And the next thing we knew, it was like it debuted at E3 and it won like best of, and it was just like, what? <laughs> I don't, this is amazing, but I didn't, you know, it, we just made. I told you it's a great game. It, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, it was, again, it was just such a, it was a fun project to do. And it was everything I wanted to do in terms of tone and sensibility. And it's still, it's just astounded me that we just did it. We just made it and we made it fairly quickly. Like, you know, obviously it's not a huge world and it's not like robust graphics, but, uh, but yeah, they assembled that game very, very quickly. And yeah, it had crazy success right off the bat, which was <laughs> just surprising and cool. Now, speaking of the graphics, even though they were based on comics, Bone and Sam and Max were both done in 3D. Mm -hmm. Somehow, Puzzle Agent was in 2D, which was refreshingly unusual at the time. How did you convince them to stick to 2D? Uh, well, because it's the way I worked. And, uh, you know, when you look at Bone, like, Jeff Smith's drawings are incredible, and they've got a lot of volume and shape, and it made it definitely made sense to make that a 3D world at the time. But uh, for the Puzzle Agent, you know, I had my process down for how I made the animated shorts that I put on YouTube. <clears throat> and so that was our starting point. It's like, how do I, how do we figure out a way that you can, you know, have the game engine work with my process? And technically speaking, Puzzle Agent is 3D because it's a bunch of flats in a 3D world. It's, it's, it's dimensional. There's a camera and there's 3D, but it's all on flats. So everything's just flat shapes and it just stays on a 2d kind of plane well, of various thinking. layers basically yeah it's just layers so but so it is still 2d but it's 2d looking because it's 2d assets mapped onto 3d flats <laughs> if that makes any sense and how come puzzle agent wasn't episodic and not released as a full season because uh, most of the games were episodic at the time that's true so, well it was just an anomaly in all respects for everything else that was being done at Telltale. Um, I don't remember why we didn't, st I think probably partly a confidence thing. It was just such a weird thing. It's like, I don't know that, you know, as much as Dan and Kevin were great friends of mine, I, I, I didn't, <laughs> I can't fault them for not necessarily having the confidence to, to make this weird thing. you know, like, I think commitment wise, they just wanted to make a small thing and see how well it worked and to have something that was, again, truly felt like a telltale property. It wasn't something that had come from elsewhere, although it came from me. But at that time, it sort of felt like I was part of the fabric of telltale. So it was something they made. But at the same time, they all recognized that it's a big risk money wise to do something brand new like that. And so uh, they just kept it small as one singular kind of thing and then when it had the success it did we they it was a scramble to try to finish out the rest of that storyline because we left it obviously on a pretty dramatic cliffhanger and um and so we did a second game just to try to finish that narrative that we'd started um and the second game's great too it's got some fun moments and things but uh I think it suffered from the fact that the time the time crunch on it was much steeper. Even though we'd done the first one so quickly, the second one was, I think, asked to be done even faster just because of how their schedule had started to fill up with things. And, and so the mm -hmm. availability of resources within the office was pretty tight. And so it was like, the only way you're going to get this done is if you do it within these little spots and timeframes. So it got a lot trickier to do the second one. And, you know, 
anybody that's done any amount of writing knows that the ending is always the hardest part. And so we concocted this weird world in the first game and it's like oh now we have to resume <laughs> now we have to figure out payoffs and resolve a lot of these things and my god that narrative got pretty crazy um again i'm stu I'm just as happy with the second game as i was with the first but it just it was a little tighter and harder to make than the first one was because there was suddenly expectations and things about how this was going to work and, and we'd established a certain tone to it that we needed to keep keep to now you've done you've worked on puzzle agent during your time at Leica, right? Mm -hmm. So when did you stop working with Telltale altogether? You left Telltale around two thousand six, and then you worked yep. on Puzzle Agent. When did you stop collaborating with them and worked full time at Leica? Well, I was full time at Leica. I mean, it was for the Telltale stuff at that point. Um, it was like an extra side gig that I would do. Again, I seem to have had a history of doing things during the day and then different things at night. Um, and so uh, I was I was full time at like a little, you know, the whole way through and just doing whatever I could to consult and cr and provide art assets for them uh, during that time. And which projects did you work on at Leica? Uh, I started working as a storyboard artist on Coraline. And then I continued story artist on um, Paranorman. And then I started out as head of story on the Box Trolls and ended up in the co-directing seat for that one. And then after Box Trolls, I did a bit of, little bit of story work on Kubo and a little bit of story work on Missing Link. And I spent a lot of my sort of last <clears throat> year and a half or two at at Leica doing, uh, helping out a lot of the marketing team stuff, doing con concepts and things. So, so basically in January, 2015, when the Academy announced that box trolls is nominated for best mm. animated feature film, did it come as a surprise? Yes and no. I mean, uh, because how of, does it work in the industry? <laughs> it's weird. The whole thing was such a weird, uh, experience. Um, because Leica, with both Coraline and Paranorman had had been nominated for Best Picture or for Best Animated Feature, there was a certain level by the time we did the box trolls that if you make a like a feature, you you darn well should be nominated. So there was a little bit of a feeling of like of expectation. I mean, you can't ever take any of that stuff for granted. But um, but the box trolls is you know <clears throat> all the like a movies are a bit strange. Uh, and unique and beautiful and, and stop motion. But I, I can confidently say that I think the box trolls is the weirdest movie we've made there. Um, for, uh, you know, weird being a good thing. I think um, I still always remember being so proud of the fact that when it showed up streaming on Netflix uh, on the sort of title page for it, there was a big quote. I don't remember who actually was the person that quoted it from some critic, <clears throat> but just describing the movie as, uh, uh, what was it saying? It said more, more Monty Python than Disney, <laughs> and I was like, I can live with that, you know, as as the description of that film. That that's you great. Take that as a compliment. Yeah. Oh, I did completely. Um. So yeah, it was it was weird it to, and and a relief and surprising to get nominated for sure. And and, and when we heard that we got nominated. <clears throat> Myself and the uh, other director, Tony, I mean, we were in full tour mode in terms of going to different places around England and uh, the States to, to promote the film. And so we were at uh, the Visual School of Arts in just outside of London, I think, <clears throat> just about to give a talk to the students there and, uh, and our uh PR person pulled us aside and like told us we had to take this call. And we're like, what? What? Why do we have to take a call right now? We're about we're about to talk to like three hundred students, um, and we we were just sitting in the cafeteria all on our own, a massive cafeteria, nobody there, and it was just like on a little speakerphone on Tony's iPhone, and uh, they were letting us know that we had been selected and, and nominated for uh, best animated feature. So we're like, oh wow, that was a good little. It uh, definitely it uh, pumped us up to do the talk for the students after that. So, 
but yeah. Made the talk uh, more interesting. Yep. <laughs> so did you go to any interesting um, Academy Award after parties? Did you meet any famous people? Well, yeah, you're surrounded with famous people, but it's a weird, I've told so many people, like it's a weird thing to be an animation person in the film world because you're not really a celebrity. You're not, you're not really one of those people. You're just kind of, you kind of have like the greatest front row seat to see all the celebrities around you. And uh, yeah, we got to go to numerous things. There was the Oscar luncheon. So everybody who's nominated for the Oscars gets to go to this special lunch that they put on <clears throat> like two weeks or three weeks before the actual event. And everybody, yeah, everybody's nominated is there. And what was cool that they did is that they don't, uh, everybody gets a t assigned seating around these little tables and I mean, you can find yourself sitting beside Tom Cruise or you can find yourself sitting with Clint Eastwood or whoever. It doesn't matter. They don't make any – they actually do try to think – mix and overlap all the different uh, mediums and people and different professions. So they're all just mixed up hanging out and uh, that was pretty cool. Uh, I got – like I got to meet Robert Duvall at the Oscar luncheon and that was like kind of amazing. Um, Were you starstruck then? Well, yeah. You're starstruck then for sure. Yeah. Finally. <laughs> And it's a weird thing, though, because uh, at those events, the other one we got to go to was the Governor's Ball, which is, uh, again, even earlier than the luncheon. And it's just a whole collection of all the, the big wigs together because that's when they give out the Lifetime Achievement Oscars and things. It's like a special thing. That's the thing that they always have filmed beforehand that they then will show at the actual ceremony, little snippets of it. And <clears throat> it's... A little less uh, formal than the Oscars themselves, so it's a little bit more casual, and people are just sort of milling around bef before all the presentations. And yeah, I just remember sitting at the table and looking around, and yeah, and there's Clint Eastwood, and there's uh, I don't know Jodie Foster. This is just all these people that are there, and you feel like you know everyone because you know their faces and you've seen their acting. So you sort of weirdly feel like you know them, but you realize I don't know these people at all as people. I can't really just walk up and start conversations because I don't really know them. And But it's a weird feel, a surreal feeling of sort of familiarity and also just kind of disconnected because you, you weren't part of that world necessarily. I don't know. It was fun. It was amazing. And I, I'm glad I had the experience, but it it is strange. Now, with so many roles you've done over the course of your career, hmm. which one's your favorite? I don't know. Uh, it depends on my uh, the day and the mood and the week. Um, I've thought about that a lot. And again, I've said it numerous times here today, and I'll say it again. I just I feel really fortunate for the ability to have done the many different things I've had the chance to do. Um, I really go back and forth. Uh I love comics and I love working on film. I love working on games. Uh, and I think it, it more than the actual medium, it gets down to the uh, dynamic of, I love working on comics because it is a completely individual thing. It's like I can get to control all the elements and it's a, a piece of art that I can truly execute and finish on my own. So I, don't necessarily, I mean, obviously I have editors and people that I trust and work with for feedback and things, but that truly feels like such a sol solo uh, expression of whatever stories and things I want to do. And I love that. But on the flip side, it's amazing to work on a film or it's amazing to work on a game because you're working with a team of artists and a team of programmers and creative people. And there's a whole element to that that I, I absolutely need to have as well like i love i love having both i love having my cake and eating it too i like having stints as a as a comic artist and doing some stuff that's very personal and very solo but man do i appreciate and love working with people and and doing it some huge group effort you know something that you could never as a single person have ever created but creating with a whole in conjunction with a whole bunch of other folks and making this thing that's bigger than all of us is just kind of amazing as well. So I don't know. It's it's both things, I guess. And some weeks I really feel like I want to work on a solo thing. And other weeks I'm like, man, I kind of miss being on a team. 
So speaking of games, now that Telltale's back, would you consider doing a Puzzle Agent 3? Uh, I would. I would totally. I've mentioned it a few times because I think I get an email about at least once or twice a week from somebody asking, like, could we do... Why don't you do more Puzzle Agent? Um, part of it was be hindered, hampered by the fact that Puzzle Agent took a bit of... Uh, bit of uh, lawyers and things to sort of unravel the rights to which was who owned what and everything and where it's finally been nicely resolved with the new folks at Telltale, at the new Telltale and myself is, you know, I, I retain the rights to the actual world and the characters. They own the actual assets of the games that were built by the original Telltale. And we've gotten a nice agreement now where they continue to sell it on Steam and, 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 and keep, keep Nelson te Nelson tethers out there in the world um but uh, yeah I would love yeah if uh, the right chemistry and people and folks got together and wanted to I I've written numerous different storylines for further games uh that I would I would love to explore given the given the chance so you they own the rights to Puzzle Agent 1 and 2 to the assets you own the rights it's a weird thing to... it's, it was such a weird thing because of you know, uh, because of the Who way... Who owns the IP? I do. Okay. So, yeah. So as far as new games go, it would it would be down to me figuring out who to work with and how to how to make that happen, I guess. Well, it's a good thing I'm a game developer. <laughs> we should talk. We should talk more off, yeah. off, after this interview. <laughs> now, uh, before we wrap up, I have a few questions from our viewers. Oh, great. Uh, right said Brett asks, do you think there's any possibility of Sam and Max Freelance Police ever being finished and released officially or leaked? God, I don't know. Can anyone take the 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 actual code? The I don't source code? I don't know. See, I don't see I'm not technical enough to know is that even possible now? Like would the I mean, I guess there's emulators that can always figure out how to play older things. Yep. Um question is if anyone actually took it before LucasArts shut that, the I don't know. Down. I mean, LucasArts did manage to. Well, I I, I know that Tim Schafer has managed. To, they've done remastered Full Throttle, and uh, mm -hmm. so there's some desire, willingness on, well, what was LucasArts to to do that? And now I don't know what the situation would be without LucasArts as an entity not not existing anymore. I don't know. No, they're a legal entity, but the problem is that they don't own the rights to Sam and Max. Well, because it's Purcells, so yeah. I don't know. It would so definitely take some some, uh, some careful, delicate uh, connecting of dots. Legal magic. Yes, and it's always, always more legal magic than you want to believe is out there. <laughs> um, Jared asks, would you consider taking on the role of director again? Maybe, yes, yes. Uh, that was, again, I, I've described that experience as one of the most harrowing I've ever had professionally, but also one of the most rewarding by the end of it. Um, definitely learned a lot. I'm glad I had that chance to, to do that and be in that role. I certainly now fully appreciate anyone who manages to complete a game or a film <laughs> in the role of director because, yeah, it's a lot to take on. Uh so yeah, the right project, the right story. I don't know. I would, I could, I could possibly see myself doing that, but it would definitely take a lot of the right things to be in place. And another question from Right Said Brett: What are some of your favorite movies of all time? Oh wow, that's an ever shifting thing. Uh, I mean, I am a your mass twenty twenty three list. <laughs> I'm a massive Stanley Kubrick fan, so I pretty much love every and all films that he's created. Um, gosh, favorite movies. It's corny, but a movie that I never stop thinking about and I never tire of rewatching and watching. Uh, and it's not exactly highbrow cinema, but Evil Dead 2 by Sam Raimi. Um, I love that film to death, man. I just, I have endless conversations with my friend Julian. We do a, a live drawing thing every Sunday night on my uh, Instagram channel. And I'm pretty sure almost every episode we've done, we end up talking about Evil Dead 2 at some point. <laughs> now, one last question for me. Sure. What are you up to nowadays? 
and what are your plans for 2023? And also, how can people stay in touch with you and your work? Oh, uh, currently I just finished a the biggest comic project I've ever done. Uh, I've made a horror graphic novel for middle school readers um, called Eerie Tales from the School of Screams. And it's a book that'll have uh, five different short stories in it that all tie into a larger story. Uh, and it's like, three, it was, ended up to being about 370 some pages. It was more, it grew while I was working on the project. Uh, I spent the last five years off and on working on it, but it's finally done. It, it will be out in July and I am super stoked to do that. Uh, so yeah, that, that's been my biggest focus for the last while. Um, I did a uh, storyboard on Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Um, that was sort of the last big film gig I, I've done. Um, and so I kind of just, yeah, I've got a few different comic pitches and projects that I'm working on right now. And I have been helping out on different friends' films and a couple of different games, but all mostly in a storyboard capacity. Um, people can find my work, my stuff on my Instagram, uh, which is Grickle14. Don't ask why. I, I think Grickle was taken. And Who I, took your username? I don't know. When I, this was long ago when I went to uh, to to create my little handle, and uh, Grickle was, according to Instagram, was already taken. So there is. I've discovered over the years that Grickle, uh, the word Dr. Seuss in the Lorax, there's the Grickle grass, and so mm -hmm. I think because of those that that uh, one sent sentence Grickle does show up for other people as <laughs> as something they you know use or or like. Um, but yeah, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and uh, I've lately shifted onto Mastodon, which has been a pretty great place to post things. Um, but it's all under the handle Grickle or Grickle14. You can always find me. And your website? Uh, Grickle.com. That one I didn't have to put the 14 on. So Grickle.com, yep. That, and Grickle.com, honestly, that will link you to anything and everything that I'm doing currently. So yeah. Cool. Well... Thank you so much, Grant, for taking the time to join me for this conversation. Sure. It's been a pleasure and an honor to talk to you today. Great. I had a great time chatting. And that concludes Daniel Albu's Tech Talk with Graham Annable. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know I did. What an interesting guy, huh? Anyway, if you enjoyed this conversation and you'd like to see more, then please consider joining us on Patreon or Coffee. It is because of our Patreon and Coffee members that we are able to keep conversations with Curtis rolling along and we sure would appreciate your support. So if you're in a position to do so, please consider supporting us on either of those platforms. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for everything, and we'll see you next time. All right, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.